Okay, so I just want to welcome everyone. Um, welcome Oswad members and friends, and thank you for attending today's book talk. Um, I'm excited to actually see people on the screen because that doesn't always happen and see some folks I know, um, fans and friends of Bryce's and of Oswad. So um, good to see everyone today. My name's Kia Caldwell and I have the honor of serving as the president of the Association for the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora, Oswad. Oswad was founded in 2000, and it's a not-for-profit organization of international scholars seeking to further their and our understanding of Africa and the African diaspora. We do this through conferences, which are held every other year, as well as symposia and virtual events such as this one. I, am, I invite you to learn more about Oswad by going to our website, oswaddiaspora.org, as well as on our social media channels. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and LinkedIn. Our next conference will take place in October of 2025 in St. Louis, Missouri, and we will be releasing that call for papers um, in April. So please also look out for that. I'm thrilled that we're able to celebrate the publication of Bryce Henson's book, Emergent Quilombos, Black Life and Hip Hop in Brazil today. Professor Henson is a former Oswald executive board member serving from 2019 to 2023, and he was instrumental in beginning Oswald's virtual book talks in 2020 during the height of the pandemic. So he, um, you know, really laid the groundwork for what he's able to um, share for uh, with us today. These virtual gatherings have been important ways to showcase the scholarship of Oswad members, especially members who have recently published their first book, such as Bryce. So it's exciting to share in the celebration of his groundbreaking scholarship. I also want to thank James Cantress for serving as today's moderator, and I'll give a brief introduction of James and then turn things over to him. James G. Cantress is an associate professor in the Department of Africana, Puerto Rican, and Latino Studies at Hunter College and the Department of History at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He is a historian of the African diaspora whose work focuses on radical Black form political formations spanning the Black Atlanta, excuse me, the Black Atlantic migration, 20th century upheavals within and across Black communities from the Caribbean to Britain, and patterns of knowledge making, resistance and sovereignty in Africa, the Americas and modern Europe. His book, Blackening Britain, Caribbean Radicalism from Windrush to Decolonization was published by Roman Littlefield in 2020. And it details the social and political histories of community formation, race consciousness, anti-imperialism, and radical intellectual and artistic activism among Caribbean subject citizens in Britain following World War II. His ongoing research investigates the growing influence of decolonizing and post-colonial Caribbean returnees by John scholars and unionists as radical resistors who created Black worlds when navigating politics of belonging and unbelonging across Black Atlantic geographies. His work has also appeared in outlets including African and Black Diaspora, Public Books, Black Issues and Philosophy, and Global Hip Hop Studies. He was named a 2021 CUNY Academy for the Humanities and Sciences Henry Wasser Awardee for Outstanding Research. Professor Contras's bio describes him as a proud member of the Oswald Executive Board, and I'm grateful to have him serving on our current board. So thanks again for joining us, and I will now turn things over to Professor James Cantris. Thanks so much, uh, Madam President. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I just want to, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Hansen, but I just want to uh, give a very quick and brief shout out to you, Bryce, for uh, being part of the uh, initial sort of Oswald book talks of which my book was featured uh, a couple years ago. So uh, with gratitude, I am excited to chat with you and everybody who's joining us about your book. Right. So I'll uh, introduce you now, and then we can jump into a conversation. Does that sound good? Bryce Henson is an assistant professor in the Department of Communication and Journalism and a faculty associate in the Africana Studies Program at Texas A&M University. He received his doctorate from the Institute of Communications Research at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. His research cuts across Black studies, 
diaspora studies, critical theory, media and popular culture, quilombos and marinage, urban ethnography, black music, global studies, and Brazilian studies. He is a co-editor of the book Spaces of New Colonialism, Reading Schools, Museums, and Cities in the Tumult of Globalization, released in 2020 with Peter Lang. His first single authored book, Emerging Quilombos, right here, Black Life and Hip Hop in Brazil, that came out in 2023, was published by the University of Texas Press. Emerging Quilombos received honorable mention for the Brazilian Studies Association Roberto Reich Book Prize in the first book category. Currently, he's a Fulbright Distinguished Scholar for Racial Studies at the Universidade Federal de Bahia in Brazil for his next research project, The Stage of Exception, Carnivalesque Pleasures and Political Violence in Brazil. Now a former executive board member, he is a proud lifetime member of the Association for the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora. Thank you for your book, Professor Henson, which by the way, uh, the University of Texas Press is offering 30% off right now with the code UTXM30. We'll put that in the chat, right? Emergent Quilombos opens up so many avenues for discussion has really energized me and I'm sure it will generate a, a really robust conversation this afternoon. So if you don't mind, can I ask my first question now? Absolutely. Great to be here. Wonderful. So who were some of your influences in developing this work? I know, having read the book that references to Sylvia Winter, Michael Hanchard, Kim Butler, scores of Brazilian Brazilianists and a host of others recur throughout. And you engage with Black feminisms, hip hop studies, cultural studies, African diaspora and Brazilian histories, and more. So I just wanted to inquire about how you put all of that together in such an impressive way. You know, thank you for saying that. Uh, I'm glad it's finally come off in an impressive way. Let's just say that's uh, the accumulations of many years of interdisciplinary thinking and engaging. Uh, with this work. And, you know, I think for a lot of us who do interdisciplinary work, we don't always put this together in an impressive way in the beginning. Um, and, you know, I think that really speaks to, you know, interdisciplinary work is hard work, right? You have to know many other fields. So I'm glad it, it all came together um, in, a, in a straightforward fashion. Um, as far as some of the influences, I'll give you some folks who are kind of lurking in the background of the book. Uh, first and foremost, uh, and you and you actually mentioned her, is Kim Butler. And of course, you know, she's a former Oswald president. Um, and, you know, for me, her work's been really important for two reasons. The first is, you know, in her book, which is, you know, pioneering, especially for those of us who come after her, is really pointing to the different forms of Blackness that circulate in Brazil. And and the different ways that people are operationalizing it for different cultures and different politics. But also for me, her theorizing on diaspora has been fundamental to my own thinking, right? You know, especially when she talks about, we need to conceive about, conceive diaspora is not just about a relationship to the homeland or reasons for dispersal, relationship to the host land, right? But also about diasporic interrelationships. And I really, that's really been fundamental for me thinking about hip hop in Bahia Right, a place that we often associate with, you know, a kind of pre-modern Africa. What would it mean to think about them also connected to a modern African diaspora? Uh, kind of also looking in the background, uh, you know, it's not not a surprise for folks. It's Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism, uh, and of course, I always like to remind folks he's written other stuff besides Black Marxism. So please go read some of his other work. Um, but you know, actually, he has an influence on the title itself. I'm not sure if folks have picked up on that, but, you know, in Black Marxism, when he's talking about the Black radical tradition and quilombos and riots and rebellions, you know, he says, and I quote, after all, it has been as an emergent African people and not as slaves that Black men and women had opposed enslavement. And for me, that, that word emergent does a lot of work. And as a British cultural studies scholar, it also makes me think of Raymond Williams' work around emo emergent cultures, right? And he says, you know, emerging culture is about new meanings and values, new practices, new relationships, and kinds of relationships that are continually being created, end quote. And so 
that's actually where the word that's why emergence in the title because of Robinson and also Raymond Williams and thinking about the ways that quilombos are continuing to have new meanings and values across different times and places. Um, and then also in the background is Carol Boyce Davies. You know, I'm thinking about, you know, of course, the work she's done from Claudia Jones, but also that article, Sisters Outside. You know, and thinking about the role of Black women in the Black radical tradition. And also, you know, for her, she was looking at Black immigrant women uh, who are outside the nation state and who are often referred to as aliens and outsiders. And for me, I thought that was also useful to think about how in Brazil, certain folks are seen, even though they are Brazilian by citizenship, they're not always seen as belonging. They're also seen as aliens or outsiders, or you know, some people have also referred to black folks as internal enemies. So those folks are all, you know, in the background. And of course I cite them, but they, you know, they have a huge impact on me. Now, directly, the two like most impactful influences on the book, I would say are Stuart Hall and Beatrice Nascimento. And Stuart Hall for me has had a huge influence actually since I was an undergraduate. Um, and for me, you know, this always reminds us about the political stakes of cultural practices, both lived and symbolic in society structured and dominance, especially as they cut through the prisons of race, gender, and class. Um, and then the other one is Beatrice Nascimento and one thing I did when I started to shift from the dissertation to the book was I really wanted to focus and center on Black Brazilian intellectual thought. Because so often we see folks who see Black people in Brazil as objects of study, but we don't always engage the knowledges they have down there. And so I really, and so actually I was introduced to be at today's nice mental at Oswald in 2015, Kristen Smith delivered a paper about her. And I remember right afterwards, I scoured the internet and I saw the only three libraries in the United States had a print copy of her article, The Concept of Quilombo and Black Culture Resistance. And I was able to get a friend to get the physical copy, scan it, send me the PDF. Uh, and so, you know, Beatriz Nascimento, I can't write this book without her, you know? And, and, and for her, you know, she argues that Quilombos can, you know, are constantly being made throughout Brazil's history, right? They're just adapting to different times and spaces and configurations. But she says, at its core, Quilombos are consist of socially excluded Black people whose cultures are not included, right? And that they're creating alternative systems in the breaches of anti-Black structures, right? And that these systems are always going to be criminalized and under attack, right? First by colonial forces, and then now by the modern state and civil society. And I remember reading her work, you know, she's saying we can find the Quilombo formation in favelas, we can find it in Bailey Funk, we can find it at the Samba School, we can find it at the Condomble Tejero. And I'm thinking about them like everything she's saying about this applies to the hip hop movement in Salvador de Bahia, where I've been doing research since 2013. Uh, and so for me, it really helped me think about you know, what do we, and we're thinking about fugitivity, right? And this is such a concept we keep coming back to in Black studies. You know, we're, we're, we're thinking about refusal and escape and taking flight. And I think what Nazi Mental really pushes us to do is to think about what do we do afterwards? What do we build? What kind of societies do we want to create? How are they constructed? How are they lived? Right. And this is why I take an ethnographic approach. Um, you know, of course, I also use textual analysis, but really at the core, this is an ethnographic book. And really think about how people are trying to live a quilombo model of life, how they're trying to create alternative social systems that foster Black life in a world that's predicated on premature death. And so those are some of the, the influences that are, you know, hiding in the background, but also, you know, if you look at my bibliography, it's it's a lot of hall and a lot of nascimento. Yeah, I, I really love that. I, I really love that uh, framing that you, that you are providing for us and thinking about the the language of emergent and emerging right because i think often we sometimes folks fall into traps sometimes right where the black radical tradition right can also sort of be abstracted as though it were traditional right mm -hmm. as if we are talking about something to which people who are contemporarily living don't really have a connection to right and i just uh, could appreciate that as a historian, right? To sort of see, right, the way that we move through time, right? But something that happens in your book that's also very important that I want to, that leads me into the uh, sort of segue is to also think about moving through space, 
right? Mm -hmm. So you make these thorough and rather precise references to spatial geography, right, in Salvador. And that allows readers to really envision the places you describe. And I think it's connected to what you just mentioned about the foundations of the text being ethnographic in nature, right? Where you can get a sense for smells. You can get a sense, certainly, for taste, right? You can get a sense, right, of the sort of tactile notion of holding a cold bottle or glass of lager, right, when it's hot in Bahia, right? And so I just, um, it made me think about this collective, right? Oswald and other folks, right? Students of Africa and its diaspora who are concerned with origins, with movement and imagining spaces, right? And I just wondered if you could speak to your process in the research for the book, moving through Salvador, moving through Bahia and elsewhere, perhaps in Brazil, and perhaps the role that space played in de developing your narrative and the entire structure of the book. Yeah, I mean, space is super fundamental to how I was conceiving the book and how I was conceiving this project. And I think a problem with Bahia is also a problem of space, and I'll, and I'll explain why. So often when we think about Salvador de Bahia, it's, you know, it's always associated with a tropical environment, right? I mean, it is on the beach, it's on the Atlantic Ocean, it has a bay of water a kind of pre-modern city, and that's evident by the colonial architecture in Pellerino. Um, and then the, the proliferation, right, the abundance of African-derived cultures, whether that's capoeira or samba, or candomblé, the Afro-blocos like Olodum, or the afro bayan cuisine like Acarajé and Moqueca. Um, and, you know, this has a long history you know, and, and I'm glad you as a historian appreciates the, the approach I'm taking. I think that's really, you know, the uh, uh, something that the Oswald historians have rubbed off on to me. Uh, but, you know, this 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 image, this dominant representation has a long history, right, of praising the retentions and survival of Africanisms in Bahia and then using that to portray Salvador as a racial paradise, right, because of the accepted African cultures. And this is really buttressed by the state government, uh, the local city hall, the white middle class, the tourist agencies and media. And I think that should be red flag number one. Why are all these folks so invested in this certain imagery? Um, but really what I found was, uh, and this actually came from my first trip to Salvador in 2008 as an undergrad, I was doing a study abroad program, is I found that these dominant representations that even I in the United States and many of us around the diaspora receiving really flattens and homogenizes the city, right? And so we don't actually get a sense for the different ways that people are living in Salvador. And also what we tend to see is that the black culture is detached from black communities, black people's lived experiences and black people's spaces, okay? And you know, I remember when I first went there. You know, I'm, I'm even the even the professor who was taking us on the trip for this portion was like, you know, look how African African Bahia is. It's so fantastic. It's exceptionalism, which I didn't particularly care for because it sounded like you're using certain black people against other black people. Um, and for me, I start, you know, I'm looking around and I say, you know, you look closely. This is not the paradise that we all think it is, right? If you look at who was poor. Who are the police stopping? Who are the police killing? You know, who, you know, who's living in nice neighborhoods versus the periphery? You know, who is going to the federal universities? Who are the doormen? Who are the domestic workers? Who has access to quality education? You know, who's working in the informal economy? You see that, you know, this place actually has a lot of human hierarchies that have social and economic and political inequalities. And actually it has a very familiar structure of racism that affirms both white supremacy and anti-blackness. And so as a cultural studies scholar, I, I was really interested in investing in understanding why this dominant representation circulates so, uh, uh, so widely, not in just Brazil, but in the diaspora across the globe and what are the meanings associated with Bahia? Um, and then what does it reveal, but also what does it obscure? Right? What is it trying to hide? Right? And this is where space comes back in, is because so much of these images are ground, these images and these representations, these meanings 
are anchored or tied to certain places in Bahia, in Salvador, that various uh, uh, powerful institutions, agencies, and actors are trying to uh, uh, shuttle people towards, right? And particularly it's Pelerino, the historic center, and the, the coastline, right? Neighborhood, posh neighborhoods like Baja, like here for Melu, Ongina, et cetera. And so for me, I, the question was, well, what happens when we go beyond these stereotypical places, these spaces in Bahia, right? And then what if we also think about race, not as a, you know, a, a cultural category, but as a social political category, right? And then we see racism not as this notion around cultural prejudice, which is always so often how this is framed in, in Salvador is like, oh, you know, so many African cultures and they're accepted, so therefore there is no racism, right? So what if we saw racism not as cultural prejudice, prejudice but as something that's structural that impacts people's material realities, their lived experiences, and also their life chances? And so all that to say, what if we anchored the diaspora, right? What if we anchored the lived experiences, the cultural expressions, the media uses, political strategies, and geographies of poor working class Black people? And that means you have to go outside of the stereotypical tourist zones, right? And so as I began this, you know, I was really thinking about, well, what are the, the again, what are the culture and politics coming out of ordinary poor and working class Black communities, right? So of course I have to go outside of the these, you know, uh, uh, tourist zones. And so really, I mean, this is also why, you know, when I was thinking about the process, you know, to ground it, this is why the first chapter is about racial conditions, right? What are the conditions that people are living in in order to understand the ideologies, the spaces, the socialities that are coming out of it? Uh, to actually be honest, I was not hip hop. I wasn't, I, I didn't always know I was gonna do a, a project on hip hop. Um, actually it was friends in Brazil, in Bahia, who directed me towards that. And they're also very generous. And, and I tell people all the time, people ask me, how did I get in this? And I said, I was lucky and I was smart enough to know I was lucky. Because uh, friends were saying, you know, I know this graffiti artist, I know this MC. And so as I began this project and making, uh, you know, contact with folks, you know, I, I saw that they were doing something similar as far as grounding diaspora cultures and identity and politics in ordinary and poor working class black communities and spaces. So, you know, to kind of give a perspective on what this is, this has me going all over the city, right? You know, people kind of ask me like, well, are you centered at one place, one group? I'm like, no, I was going everywhere around this city. And it was actually a fantastic way to understand the city, but this has me going to open mics, to clubs, to concerts, to festivals, to protests, to workshops. Uh, you know, I'm also glad I started this when I was much younger because that I I don't have the energy for this anymore, <laughs> right? Um, but also, you know, I think one thing that was really important and I was I think was really meaningful for folks who are in the book was that I would go to their neighborhoods. You know, I you know I say I would like to do an interview with you. And next, I kind of use the interview as a setup to do participant observation. You know, I say you know can I come out like you know where where do you want to meet? They would ask me, what do I want to meet to do, you know, the interview? I said, I'm more than happy to come to you, right? And they're like, they were they were so excited. And soon I would go there and they would show me around. I would meet their family, you know, people who were being nosy would just drop by. You know, like, there's, there's some research in here, you know, trying to, trying to learn more about hip hop um, and so-and-so, right? Um, but, you know, and I think folks were really appreciative that I was not trying to recreate this romantic image of Salvador, that I was actually willing you know, I was interested in Black cultures, but insofar that they're tied to Black communities, right? And so I think, you know, this is where, you know, I'm, and this is why, you know, you, you for me, was so important. And I think in some ways, I'm not necessarily sure it was insecure, but I wanted to tell people, I'm like, look, I was here and I can, and I can prove I was here because look at the amount of detail that I give you, right? Um, and so, you know, I wanted to, you know, to tell people like, okay, this is, you know, the night of the Black beauty. Okay, this is, you know, this is how hot and sweaty the bus is, right? This is a nice cold lager, right? Where you smell in the ocean air. This is how you might feel. That I, I, I yeah. think you sort of allude to that in a couple of times. Like, you might be just really tired. You might really, right? You're going up steps, for instance, right? You're on the bus for a long time. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I, I'm just, I'm just, um, I'm just corroborating as a reader, right? That perspective. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, and, you know, I really wanted to, you know, to, and also I think for me, I felt a responsibility as a researcher, as someone who is doing this work to show the other side of Bahia that folks aren't seeing that often circulate. Right. And then also to show it's not all bad. Right. It's not, you know, because part of the other side is, well, you know, Salvador is so violent. Right. And, and, and they don't always attach race to it, but it's definitely racialized. Right. And I'm like, no, 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 no. These are the systems in play that produces these these connotations. Right. But here's what here's what black communities and the black cultures that come out of. This is what it looks like. Right. And it's not what you think it is. Right. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And it sort of speaks to the kind of pitfalls of representation that I think a lot of, of the early part of the book is focusing on, right? Which is like, well, this is the image of Salvador, right? That is acceptable or that is promoted. Whereas you seem to be much more interested in thinking not only about that, is, which is not represented widely, but how the people who are responsible for it conceptualize and understand themselves, right? And I, I would suppose that that is why the Quilombo figures so significantly, right? So if I might ask, and in particular, you mentioned some of the differences between places that you were going to in the city of Salvador, right? And I thought that was provocative. And in the book, you frame Quilombos as uh, Black spaces of culture rather than as spaces of Black culture. Could you clarify that distinction for us? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a... Uh, so first of all, actually, I borrowed this this term from uh, Nelson Maka, who is a local intellectual poet, professor, and activist in Salvador. And I think it's really important to distinguish between, like you said, Black spaces of culture and spaces of Black culture. Excuse me. And, and, and the main reason, too, is for this is, is, you know, for example, in the opening of chapter one, I talk about going to Pellerino and these kind of stereotypical experiences you would have based on the representations of Salvador. And what people often don't know is that a lot of these places that are promoting afro bayan culture or Black culture are owned by white people. You just don't see them, right? But if you see who the workers are, you see who's performing, it's Black folks, right? But it's not always for Black people. And, and I'll explain why. So this chapter really emerges out of my first time doing research, preliminary research in 2013. And I was going to this place called the Sankofa Bar, which was owned by a Ghanaian immigrant. And now this is in the middle of Peladino, right? So again, this is the place where people are celebrating afro bayan culture, okay? But this was a space for Black people, right? Not a space for white people to consume and experience Black cultures, or for Black people to have to labor and work. Right. It was really important it was in the middle of the city because the public transportation is very downtown oriented. So if you live in this periphery and you want to go to this one, you can't just go like this. You have to go downtown and then back up. Right. So having Sankofa in the middle of the city was really important to make sure it was accessible to a lot of folks. OK. And so while I was going there, it was a place for, uh, you know, I will go on Wednesday nights and they had this event called uh, Black Ituji, which is the combination of Black, uh, the English word Black and also attitude, but then also a play on Negratuji or Negratu. And I apologize for folks who actually speak French, but that's the best I got. Um, but, you know, this was a place where Black people could convene and share their culture, right? So, you know, you see spoken word, rap music, poetry. Um, it was also a very political space. So they had community meetings there, especially during the 2013 uh, protests during the Confederations Cup. It's where I met a lot of uh, participants, actually like Juan and Cajos. I actually met them there at the San Kofa Bar. And in August of that year, uh, some land use city employees and five military police officers barged in and they scared the crap out of everyone. And they, you know the police had their weapons out like, like I said, terrified folks, and they took Sankofa's equipment and thousands of dollars of technology. And this is this is not insignificant for, you know, here in Brazil. And the city said that the, the confiscation of the equipment was for excessive noise and complaints from neighbors. And people are like, this is ridiculous because this is the place you go to be loud, right? And to have music and, and to be festive. And DJ Sankofa, the, the owner of it, you know, he makes his reference, you know, he he talks about how 
Sankofa Bar has been targeted by the state for many years, right? And this is what he said in, in a newspaper article. He said, Peladino has always been a place of entertainment. This is not the first time police came here to provoke me. A few years back, the police entered the bar wanting to shut down the party. I got in front of them and said they were only doing it because of their uniform. I despised this and I was arrested. Okay. So on August 19th, people start protesting in support of the Sankofa bar. And this phrase comes out, I'm against the criminalization of black spaces, right? And again, this is a space for black people, right? And so eventually, unfortunately, Sankofa bar shut down later that year. And then Nelson Maka in uh, the newspaper for, at the beginning of 2014 makes a contrast between spaces of black culture and black spaces of culture, right? And so for him, right, Spaces of Black culture are normative spaces, which is to say are white spaces that permit certain Black cultures in and the people who are performing, right? So it's kind of this vetting process of like, well, I like this kind of Black culture, so you can come in, right? And so Blackness is always about culture, right? It's very much devoid of its social and political uh, uh, realities, right? And so what he says in the newspaper, he goes, you know, a foundation or publicly financed project can promote afro buy-in cultural events but every day, their people still have to pass the majority of the buy-in population who live in pockets of misery in a society that's adverse to black skin, right? And so the latter is, right, a black space of culture, which is to say a space that has to be racially marked because it's not seen as normative, right? But it's a space where black people can come together. And then from there, the cultures can that emerge from there are always gonna be inherently black, right? Because it's coming from black communities and spaces, right? But a black space is a is a social space, but it's also a political space, right? <laughs> and Maka ties this Sankofa bar, I mean, he ties this himself to Quilombo. So he says, this persecution has passed historically through Lundu, Capoeira, Samba, Maracatu, Afro blocks, black carnival, candomblé, real funk parties, by Pagogi, they are cultural quilombos that fight against laws that create and recreate mechanisms that impede our human trajectory, right? And so he's acknowledging that how Black spaces are seen as spaces of Black people who are also dehumanized, right? Who are seen as enemies who must be under surveillance and attack, yeah. Um, and so this is the way, you know, this was really important for me to help flesh out or, you know, uh, an analytical framework to think about the difference, right? You may see black culture everywhere. And actually, in fact, you do in Salvador, right? But not everywhere is a black space. And so that was really helpful for me to, like I said, go beyond spaces like Pellerino, like the coastline and show, you know, black spaces where black people actually are and the spaces they create for themselves. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's really uh, a terrific answer. And, it, and of course, it's making me think about hip hop. Right. And it's making me think about hip hop as a quilombo. Right. And it's making me uh, want to ask how buy in hip hop creators right, respond to conditions. Right. Which you refer to as abject blackness. Right. Mm -hmm. In ways that differ from dominant or more acceptable responses. Right. To that condition. Right which you refer to as the valorization of mixed or folkloric blackness, right? So could you talk us through what mixed and folkloric blackness mean and how folks in Salvador and the hip hop movement in Salvador resist, right? Or, or what they are doing pursues something quite disparate and divergent from those more acceptable practices. Yeah, and so, you know, part of you know, talking about mixed blackness or folkloric blackness or abject black was just a way to have like an easy shorthand. And I'm, and I'm sure for those who are familiar with Brazil or familiar with some of the ways uh, uh, that I've defined these. So, <clears throat> and also part of this, I wanted to, to be clear that, you know, blackness itself is not homogenous, right? It has its own contradictions, right? And so part of this, I wanted to, to, to map out the different ways that blackness uh, the blacknesses are uh, uh, positioned within the city, right, and out and across Brazil. And so, mixed blackness is when you know what many folks know as probably the racial democracy thesis, right? Is that uh, blackness can be acceptable in so far that it's mixed, that it's diluted, and it's hybridized, 
right? And so, you know, when we hear that Brazil is a mixed race nation, right? Blackness is only acceptable insofar that it's diluted, right? That it's actually getting away from blackness and it's getting closer to whiteness, right? And so you see this through various forms, such as the hypersexualized mulatta, uh, uh, you know, the way people try to emphasize uh, particular brown coded identifications, right? It's like, oh, I'm not black, I'm, you know, coffee with milk, right? Or I'm cinnamon, right? These all, all kind of color descriptors, right? So people that say, well, I'm not black, I'm some kind of form of mix, right? Um, but this also shows that blackness cannot be its own entity, right? Um, it cannot, uh, uh, you know, it has to be, it can be included insofar that it's mixed, right? And so it still keeps the predominant notion of blackness as abject blackness, right, in place, right? Mixed blackness becomes exceptional, which means it's an exception to blackness, the rule of blackness, right? And of course, here I'm thinking about, you know, blackness as abject in the way that black people have been assigned meanings of being non-human, as other, as non-citizen, as not having the same rights, um, as savage, right, to justify enslavement and exploitation, right, to maintain a racial hierarchy and order. And so as I talk about folkloric Blackness, this is part of this multicultural turn, not just in Brazil, but also throughout Latin America, where there, you start to see the inclusion of ethnic difference, right? So one can be Black on the basis is about one's ethnic identity and culture and group difference, right? And so often this is about recuperating a perceived lost African identity, okay? But this cannot invoke questions around structural racial inequalities or make demands for social, economic, and political transformation, right? And so again, this is about prejudice and tolerance, right? So we can accept Blackness as far as it's mixed, but now we can also accept it if it's folkloric, right? And Bahia actually has a huge role in this because Bahia and Salvador in particular are seen as providing this African ancestry and culture that also then goes on to be mixed into the nation, right? So it's kind of this reenactment, reperformance of this colonial romance, if you will, right? So you see this through, you know, these very cheap uh, um, celebrations of condomble, of, like I said, afro uh, Bahian food. Um, and, and what you see here really is that Afro becomes this static and timeless culture, right? And homogenous. And to be clear, right? And I, and I use folklore on purpose because, you know, and I know we're going to talk about this later, right? People are very protective of their ancestral cultures, but they're very upset when it becomes folkloric and commodified, right? And becomes detached from the communities that it's producing, right? And so, and again, just like mixed Blackness, folkloric Blackness becomes an exception to the rule of Blackness, right? Which again, the base, no one's actually undermining, no one's actually trying to intervene into the notion of what about this Blackness that continues to dehumanize Black people, okay? And so what I try to show in the book is how the hip hop community is not trying to evade abject Blackness, right? They're not hiding from it. Um, they're not trying to be read as acceptable in Brazilian society, right? And really what to say is that we do not need to redeem ourselves in order to be accepted. We are fine as we are. And so in many ways, what they're doing is they're reclaiming an abject Blackness, right? And trying to subvert its negative connotations, right? And attaching to a new set of relations and meanings and aesthetics and practices and identities and belonging, right? that draws from a variety of ancestral and also diaspora cultures, right? So it's, it's hip hop, but it's also ancestrality. It's also negratuji, et cetera. And I find this really important. I know you brought this up earlier about representation because so often, and I, and I get my students doing that, and I teach a lot of classes on race and media. I get a lot of students saying, we just need better representations. We need positive representations to counter the negative ones. And I get that, I've been there before, right? But what often happens is the positive representation sits side by side with the negative, right? And then often what happens is the positive is used against the negative, right? And so what happens is we end up policing ourselves, right? It's like, why can't you be one of the good ones? Why are you one of the black? Why are you one of the bad ones, right? And so what the hip hop movement is doing is saying there's nothing wrong with who we are. We don't have to be exceptional. We don't have to be, 
you know, we don't have to be acceptable to a, a white Eurocentric consciousness. We are fine just as we are. We're going to valorize that. That just means we have to create other systems for ourselves if we're going to valorize ourselves, right? And so part of what they're doing is not asking other poor working class Black folks to change who they are. They're trying to put them in a different system that serves them, right? And so this is what I was thinking about the different Blacknesses that are at play, right? You have this mixed Blackness that, you know, goes back to Brazilian identity, you know, back in this national formation in the 30s, you have this form of ethnic difference, which, you know, and I will be, I will say, right, this, this, this folkloric Blackness at one point, you know, was, you know, it had its moments of resistance, right? And, and I think for, you know, uh, of course, historians know this, right? So often our histories of resistance become incorporated into a hegemonic block, right? And then neuter that political impetus that made it so, so, so appealing, this that made it so, mm -hmm. had such potential, right? For a different kind of future. And, and I think, you know, the hip hop community has learned is that, you know, we don't, no matter how much we change ourselves, we're still not going to be, valuable in the way that they want us to be. We have to valorize ourselves and we have to change the, 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 the meanings associated with poor and working class black folks, right? We have to change, you know, the, the baseline of what, the, of the meaning surrounding blackness. Yeah, I, I think that that's a really profound sentiment, right? It's sort of moving from a kind of narrative that allows for the black, the historical black martyr to become the nation's hero right mm -hmm. long after they're gone and for a completely different reason right but this idea of protecting and reproducing themselves in their own culture for the sake of it being uh valuable because that's the way they understand it right is quite different right and 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 you make a you make a, a very important point about that frequently throughout the book, which I appreciated. And something else I really appreciated that I wanted to ask you about was uh, in the fourth chapter. Uh, the fourth chapter is called Intimacy. Is that correct? I, I believe it is. Right. You spend time in that chapter. This book is, uh, you spend time, I'll say, right, discussing the ways Black Brazilian men, right? It's interdisciplinary, this text, but also, um, intersectional, right, in many important ways, right? And in this, the, the focus is on Black Brazilian men grappling with uh, heteropatriarchal avenues that are available to them because they are dominant in the society that they are from, right, and that they live in. But also, you discuss the way that your friends, your interlocutors, and others might insist, again, we go back to the ethnographic reality, that they walk with you, that they stand with you that they wait with you when you were all waiting for the bus to get from the periphery, the peripheral areas where you were to go back to where you were staying, right? At night for hours so that they can ensure that you did so safely. You also mentioned women doing this for you on the gates or, or just inside of the gates of a university, is that right? Right, yeah. looking out for you saying like, yes, this bus is saying that it, it's not going there, but the bus is going where you need to go, right? And looking out for you in this way. Could you say more about sort of this care, this intimate care and security that they wish to extend to you, especially when we contrast that, right, with prevailing notions, right, from the U.S. point of view that is happening in Western Europe and I'm certain is also happening in Brazil around what a, a congregation of Black men at night looks like, mm -hmm. because it seems to be the opposite of care mm -hmm. or in love. Yeah. 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 So this is, I mean, I've been working on this chapter for a very long time. I remember when I first started writing it in 2017. And it's been very fulfilling and also very difficult to write, but I'm very, you know, pleased with you know how it how it came out. Um, you know, and part of this, I wanted to think about, you know, if 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 a quilombo is about creating alternative social systems. This means we have to also rethink the socialities that we have with one another, right? What are the different ways that we're relating with one another? And so for me, I wanted to think about how are Black men connecting with other Black men in ways that disrupt racialized gender norms, right? Particularly for Black men, right? And that so often we are valorized insofar 
um, you know, for our cap physical capabilities, whether that's athletic abilities, musical talent, fighting cap uh, cap uh, capabilities, or sexual prowess, right? And I was like, what, it, what would it mean to value Black men for our emotional and affective attributes, right? What would that look like? Um, and to be clear, the hip hop movement here is not devoid of hyper masculinity or sexism or homophobia, right? So this is not, you know, I'm not saying, you know, they, they've solved the problem here by no means, right? But I want to think about what are these different ways that Black men are connecting with one another, um, you know, and embracing these alternative modes of masculinity that are antithetical to the dominant modes uh, uh, um, that are simply available or or uh, they're made available or the black men think are available for them. And also, you know, I'll say in this, you know, someone who's kind of lurking in the background for me in this is Joseph B, right? You know, he has this quote, black men loving black men is a revolutionary act of the eighties. And of course he's talking about gay black men in the height of the HIV AIDS uh, crisis, right? But it really stuck with me to think about what would it mean to think about how, you know, cisgender heterosexual black men are loving other cisgender and heterosexual black men in action uh, through notions of trust, of vulnerability, of connection, right? And so I start the chapter off talking about Zumbi, uh, who was the leader of the Palmadis uh, Quilombo for much the, or for part of the 17th century. And there's a statue of him here in Salvador. And he has a shirt off, very muscular. He has a spear in one hand, there's a knife in another. He's very strong, stoic, right? And I think this becomes this idea of, you know, black men needing to be strong, emotionless, uh, um, protectors, right? And this is, you know, this is part of reclaiming. And I think this is what happens with the folkloric blackness too, is that people think they need to go back and recuperate a certain gender norm that actually never existed, right? It's like we need to go back and reclaim our, our masculinity that we lost on the plantation. This is nonsense. Right. Um, it's just really, you know, the way that we have internalized Western norms of masculinity and the way that they've also become uh, 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 racialized and, and internalized amongst us. That said, I also I shift to two rappers here who really are pointing out the inadequacies of a hyper masculinity that is not just in Brazil, it's not just in black communities, it's also in hip hop communities. Right. So one rapper, uh, Bandao. Jivadaji, true vandal, you know, he he talks about, you know, he makes it, you know, he blows up, he goes mainstream, he's rapping in English, he's traveling the world on tour, and he is so lonely. He can't trust anybody, right? And 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 part of that I was thinking about, well, what does it mean, right? What what do black men, what do we lose when we also adhere to hyper masculinity? Right. We always talk about what we gain, and that's that's totally fine, right? There's certain privileges that come with that. But also we never really talk about what do we lose. Right. And so he's struggling with that. He's like, I don't actually like this. I don't like who I am. I don't like the the world I have put around me. This is actually very isolating, right? And this is actually a problem that many black men we have. Right. And then I also move to another rapper, Baco Eshu the Blues, who writes a song called uh, The School of Jay-Z. Right, and it's saying basically, you know, I'm sorry, Jay Z, and to my knowledge, at least at this point, they have never met, right? But it's basically he's it's a he's breaking up with Jay Z as a metaphorical uh, uh, relationship, right? And he's saying like, I just can't do it. This is not healthy for me. I'm trying to be you in order to avoid being me, right? And when he's doing it, he's actually showing a lot of care. He's like, I'm sorry. I hope we can still be friends. I'm not going to ghost you. I'm trying to do better. But like, this is just not working out for me, right? And I just found it fascinating that he's breaking up with Jay-Z, which you know, we think about breaking up, especially for Black men. We think about only in romantic relationships, right? <laughs> someone that he has a different kind of relationship to, right? And I just thought that was so impactful to think about, right? What would it mean to handle the same care Black men have with other Black men that we might with a romantic relationship? And so then I, you know, the, the latter part is, you know, transitioning to, well, what, what does it look like for Black men to care for other Black men? And I talk about, you know, doing research in the periphery, in the favelas, and, you know, this is way before Uber arrived, and also as a broke grad student, so I was taking the bus all the time. And every single time, folks were like, no, let me walk you to the bus stop. Let me walk you there. I need to make sure you arrive with safe, you know, safely. And 
you know, I talk a lot about being at Carlos's house and Joelle's house. And this is in Superbana, which is, you know, kind of the northern part of the city. So it's really far from typically where I'm staying at. And no matter what time I left, it was always dark just because how close to the equator we are here. But it didn't matter what time it was. I mean, I see them stop arguments with their girlfriends. They're like, look, Bryce is leaving. I got to go walk him to the bus stop. And we, we can talk about that in different you know contexts, right? Maybe he's trying to avoid something, right? But he's like, look, I got to make sure he makes it safe, right? And I remember one time I was with Carlos and the bus was taking forever. And I, I'm pretty sure he waited about an hour and a half to two hours with me. And eventually we he called me a motor taxi and I got in, right? And every single time, he was like, let me know you get home safe, right? Message me on Facebook, message me, you know, on WhatsApp, whatever. And, you know, after a little while, I I'm not going to lie, I kind of struggled with it, right? That's probably my own fragile masculinity. Yeah. You know, you know, having to have another black man take care of me and protect me like I was a woman or a child, you know, and, and I'm saying that mildly facetiously, but only mildly facetiously, right? You know, part of this too is Carlos is younger than me. I'm like, oh, I can handle myself. You know, I'll be fine. But deep down, I actually felt much safer and comfortable, right? Knowing that he was walking me, that he he knew this neighborhood, he knew folks around there. You know, I definitely felt safer. And so I kind of developed a sense of comfort around this. And, you know, and, and they started this from the jump when I started doing my research, right? They're like, no, 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 you are, you're going to get home safe. Nothing's going to happen to you on my watch, right? There was a certain love and care, right, that they were showing towards me. And, and this was beginning, so they really didn't have to do it. But they're like, no, it was part of this kind of ethos and, and, and politics for them. And so really what drove home the point for me is I think in 2015, 2016, you know, it's the same scenario, I'm walking, walking with Carlos. Uh, no, actually, I was about to leave. And I said, you know, man, I, I, I could walk myself to the bus stop. I know how to get there. And he looked at me like I was silly. He's like, no, you are not going to do that. I'm walking you to the bus stop because this is my neighborhood. He's like, you know, every time you're here, I introduce you to everyone because I want people to know not to mess with you because they're with me. Right. He's like, some young kid try to come up with me, you know, put his fingers inside his jacket and be like, oh, give me your money. He's like, you got to be kidding me trying to rob me. He goes, if that happened to you, Bryce, I don't know that you'd be able to read that situation. Right. And he's like, no, I'm here to protect you. And then he said something was very profound to me. He goes, but you would do the same thing for me in the United States. Right. So for him, right. This wasn't about who's more manly, who's more dominant, who, you know, who is the better protector, right? It was about protecting the collective. Who has an advantage in a certain place and, and, and you know, who can protect one another the best, right? And this can be based on a variety of factors. Um, you know, people are like, I'm going to look out for you, right? But if I was vulnerable, I would trust you to take care of me too, right? I can trust you to have your safety you know, I could trust you to have my safety in your hands as well. Um, you know, and one thing I actually had to take it out of the book. I just didn't get time to really flesh it out. But really one thing I was thinking about was various African-derived religions, right? Mm. All being around seniority, right? Initiation, insider, outsider, right? And that, you know, sure, in pure age, I'm older than Carlos, right? But in terms of age in Salvador, in that neighborhood, in the hip hop community, he's way older than me, right? He has more seniority than me, right? And this is where he gets to, uh, to assert his authority over me, right? But this is not a guarantee. This is not a given. Because he said in the United States, that actually, you know, becomes inverted. I have more seniority over him, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, I also talk about, you know, these two Black feminist uh, uh, women rappers, you know, who do the same thing. They're like, no, 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 this is our city. We're going to make sure you get home safe, right? So you wait right there. And I did. <laughs> and say, well, we'll watch out for your bus and we'll wave you and you come running over and you hop on there. You let us know you get home safe, right? Um, and so for me was, you know, wh what ways are Black men, you know, as we, you know, and I'm not saying this is going to dismantle patriarchy, right? But what kind of other socialities, what do we gain when we don't always adhere to this, right? To dominant modes of masculinity that's based on physical capabilities, but not emotional attributes. It's not about connection. It's not about trust. It's not about bonds, right? Um, and then also, you know, the important thing is how we build this intimate, intimacy and trust, right? Based on this notion of keeping us alive, 
right? For me, that's a certain care and intimacy. But so often people think just like the United States, right? Black people don't care about other black people, right? Or that black people, you know, just, you know, oh, you know, premature death, it is what it is, right? They're like, no, 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 we're, we're nobody is disposable. Yeah, that's, it stuck with me. It really stuck with me. And it also made me think about the way you analyze different practices, right? Hip hop practices, whether we're talking about the lyrics, right? Of rappers or the murals that uh, graph artists, right? Are painting, right? Even the uh, music videos that folks are making, right? With respect to the, the sort of central role of Quilombo theory in influencing the artists that you are spending time with, right? The motivations, particularly with regard to thinking and expressing different modalities related to gender, right? In effect, countering the, the sort of ungendering, right? Which you so aptly describe, right? And we know you've, you've referenced, right? In that regard, right? Seem to portend uh, to a particular Black Brazilian feminism, right? Which we could learn a great deal from. Would you take a minute to maybe say more? Yeah, so, I mean, when we talk about the ungendering, right? Of course, yeah, you know, yeah. Miller's is also in the background too, right? And so, you know, uh, I want to make sure, you know, she's recognized as well. And part of this, what I was thinking, um, you know, you definitely see this ungendering in Brazil as well. And what I found fascinating was how, again, the ways that Black people refused to, to quote unquote, redeem themselves was also highly gendered, right? Their refusal to not only perform permissible modes of Blackness, but also how that cuts across gender, okay? And so, you know, this happens in a variety of places. You know, there is, I mean, I remember, you know, the, this hip hop feminist collective, you know, many women were adamant that they wanted a place in hip hop, right? As MCs, as artists, right? Because so often they're rele relegated to being managers, R&B artists, as fans, et cetera. And then what they are represented is as objects, as either the mother lover, the black woman warrior, or a very kind of sexually vulgar figure. And I remember one, you know, she told me, she goes, look, I want to be an MC, but I'm going to be an MC as a woman. I'm not going to be a surrogate man, right? I'm not going to perform these notions of hypermasculinity, of dominance, of, of violent potentiality, right? So I'm going to occupy that place as a woman. And I also want to convey femininity as a site of strength and power. Okay. Um, and what I saw a lot of women do in the hip hop movement was also subvert um, you know, the, the, the way that a poor working class Black womanhood is also seen as sexually deviant, and that becomes seen as a threat, right? Because many of these women are seen as being excessive, uh, uh, excessive makeup, uh, excessive jewelry, excessively bright colors, say lipstick, um, showing excessive amounts of, of bodily flesh, right? Um, but also sexually excessive, right? That they will, you know, there's, uh, I mean, in many ways it's kind of a, a remix of the Jezebel controlling image, right? And what I argue is that they're, they're, these are women who are, you know, not, their, their sexuality is not beholden to a white or black patriarchy. And that's seen as being threatening. Right. Instead of being derided for that, many black women in the movement are taking that and using it as a site of militancy. Right. They're like, yeah, you damn right, we're dangerous. Right. We're the people you need to be worried about. Right. We are, you know, we are in the hip hop movement. We are not going to stand for racism, sexism, class exploitation, uh, respectability politics, et cetera. Right. And so, Again, instead of seeing themselves as having to redeem themselves and, and, and perform a certain respectable femininity, which is always racialized as white, right? just saying, no, 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 right? Black women, part of our ungendering, yes, we are powerful. And we don't have to be powerful in the way that white women are. We are powerful in our own ways, right? They're actually in a way that can disrupt entire Brazilian society in a way that depends on not just racial hierarchies, but also gender hierarchies. 
And part of, you know, and I'll, 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 I'll end with this part, you know, in the last chapter, I talk about how graffiti artists represent Yemenja, uh, the deity of beauty, of motherhood, uh, water of life. They represent her not as the Virgin Mary, which typically she is juxtaposed with, right, because of Afro-Catholicism and the history, of course, of colonialism, slavery, and the role of the Catholic Church, right? But they're actually representing her as ordinary Black women, right? These are women in the community. They are mothers. They are older. They are corpulent. Uh, one artist says, she goes, I am making uh, gorgivas, right? Or chubby divas, right? So, but I want these women to be seen as divas, divas as godlike, right? And these are the women in our community because so often black women are often on the wrong side of human binaries, right? And they say, no, 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 no. Instead of negating their humanism across, you know, across these various intersectional axes, we're gonna affirm it. And actually we're gonna affirm it not through a Judeo-Christian tradition, right? We're gonna do it through African derived religions. And I, you know, I, and, and, and I thought that was really important to say, you know, Black motherhood, right, and Black beauty are intertwined, and that Black women, even the Black women who are, you know, Black women, ordinary Black women in Brazil, don't even have to conform to the ways that typical Black women are included into Brazil, which is to say the hypersexualized mulata, or even the African queen, right, that these ordinary Black women in communities who are people's aunts, mothers, uh, um, neighbors, et cetera, right? Is that they are also human and, and, and secretizing them with, or juxtaposing with the image of Jaws away to affirm their own humanities. Wow, this is uh, e extremely generative in so many different ways that I wanna just say thank you for detailing that further for us, right? I wanna open it up. I have more questions, but I'm looking at the time, right? And I, I wanna open it up to the audience, um, it, we have this Q and A function. If folks want to put questions there, that would be preferred. But I suppose you could also raise your hand, right, and, and jump on if you really want to. Um, do, have we got any yet? If not, I want to ask this other question. Right. How about you ask the question while we wait for the question to roll in? Okay. Okay. The question I want to ask is about the end of the book. It's actually really the coda of the book, right? A, a really lovely coda. And, and something that you say is that quilombos are about love. And it made me just wonder how we all might move from anger right, toward love. Yeah, you know, I really struggled to wrap up the book, you know, have a conclusion, especially after the seventh chapter, you know, I was like, man, I'm done. Um, and I just, you know, I was like, where did this book come from, right? It came from a place of love. And I'll explain what I mean by love. But also, you know, I wrote the dissertation, which this book started as, I wrote it out of anger. I'm not going to lie, right? And of course, Audre Lorde tells us, you know, the uses of anger are also very valid. But I kept also thinking about, you know, sure, we can understand the world, we can critique the world, and this is often what I ask my students to do, but rarely do we ask what world do we want to live in? And I think so often we're so hell-bent on tearing down the world we're in, the different structures of oppression, the human hierarchies, the forces that oppress us, that we rarely think about what it is we want to build in this place. And what ends up happening is that so often, we tend to reproduce certain hierarchies that we're trying to get away from. And so I really want to think about what does it mean to come from a place of love to rebuild a society? And, you know, and of course, you know, the fourth chapter intimacy was, was that was really kind of in the, in the forefront. Um, but, you know, I was also thinking with Bell Hooks on this, right? You know, she says, I think that part of what a culture of domination has done is raise that romantic re relationship up as the single most important bond, when of course the single most important bond is that of community, right? So what does it mean to love on Black folks, particularly those who are most marginalized, excluded, right? Instead of internalizing our own hierarchies, right? Those who are more acceptable for whatever reasons, right? Instead of affirming that, what if we 
inverted that and love those who are most marginalized, right? And try to create a different world with those folks. And so that was really, you know, I was thinking about love as a as a communal uh, formation, right? What open ourselves up to vulnerability, to social bonds, to connections in ways that this world doesn't allow for us, right? And, and seeing the potentiality in that. And so, you know, I mean, I call it a diasporic love letter, right? It was just, it was, it is, you know, it's, it's exactly what it says it was, right? It was a love letter to all of us. I'm muted. I'm just saying, wow, and thank you. Thank you. We do have some questions. We do have okay. some questions from the from the crowd. Uh, Amber, Henry, you wanted to ask a, a question? Yes, thank you so much, Bright Tenson, for this fantastic book. As someone working with maroon populations in Colombia, I'm really excited to have this work. I have two questions, one about the uptick in marunage and maybe the danger or possibility of thinking about quilombos and maroon spaces as metaphor. And the second is about gender. So the first question simply asks, there's been a really, um, people have been taking up this notion of fugitivity and that's led to a lot of folks thinking about marunage in this kind of imaginary or metaphorical sense. I'm thinking here of Asada Shakur's reference to her own self as a 20th century Maroon, uh, Russell Maroon Shoaz, who was nicknamed Maroon for escaping from prison, and then also Eveline's um, Lauren Perlant's work thinking about Arturo Schomburg as an intellectual Maroon. So I'm curious whether in your work you had to deal with this tension between traditional Maroonage as escape from one geographic space to another, and what quilombos mean in this kind of intellectual, um, metaphorical, or also aesthetic sense. So do you think we need to differentiate between traditional marunaj and this other type of marunaj that allows for other things such as hip hop being marunaj? Thank you. Yeah, so I mean, also what I wrote in the coda was, you know, not everything is a quilombo. And I think, you know, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, oh, God, like, I can see it now. The Jay-Z brunch crowd is going to start calling themselves a quilombo or, you know, Black tech bros at Amazon are going to have quilombo happy hour, right? And this metaphor um, that I think you're talking about. What, you know, and this is where I really am grounding myself in Beatriz Nascimento's work. You know, she points out, you know, she kind of gives this framework of what a quilombo is, right? Again, socially excluded Black people whose cultures are not accepted or cre creating alternative social systems, right? And who are constantly under attack. And I think that's really important, right? Uh, so I think, you know, those of us who are most privileged are probably not going to be in a quilombo, right? And so I think it's really important that, you know, we, we think about, uh, um, you know, I'm I'm worried about people wanting to dilute the, the the concept, right, and the praxis of it. I think to your point, and this has actually been a discussion I know in Brazil, is when people are talking about urban quilombos, um, that we also can't lose sight of what they call remnant quilombos here, right? Those folks who are still living uh, uh, on the historical lands of, you know, their quilombo ancestors, right? And I think that's extremely important. Um, but I don't think, I would say, you know, as metaphor, I'm more interested in, and I think maybe this is where the ethnography in me comes in, right? Community formations, right? And space. And I think that's really the, the, the importance of the quilombo is being very specific about what is and isn't a quilombo. And then how are people forming it? Um, you know, I think for folks, it's it's not a metaphor, right? It's something they're actually invested in. Um, and, I, and I'm just speaking from the Brazilian context because that's what I know best. Thank you. Thanks for your question. We have another question. It's from, pardon me, let me just make sure. It is from Kyle Mays. And he's, and he's asking, uh, Dr. Henson, how can your important work on quilombismo contribute to conversations on the intersection of Blackness and indigeneity? That's a fantastic question. You know, I think there's a question about, you know, I mean, I think 
one thing that people are starting to grapple now is to what degree are black people indigenous and what constitutes indigeneity. And I know indigenous studies has often elided the question of Africa and black folks. And part of this, and this is where I talked about, and I know we didn't get a chance to talk about, but you know, people talk, people embracing their ancestrality, right? And trying to recreate or continue practicing their ancestral knowledges, uh, uh, states of being, metaphysical ways of life. Um, and so really, you know, one thing that's really important for Quilombos, right, is the relationship that folks have to land, right? And I think that's a very indigenous practice. And this actually speaks more to remnant, uh, uh, remnant Quilombo communities and more kind of rural, rural areas, you know, but folks are trying to, you know, assert their African indigeneities in the Americas, right? And, you know, one thing that Beatriz Nascimento theorizes is that, you know, Black people continue to assert their African ancestrality, right, through the relationships between the body and the land. Right, that black people are carrying their various cosmologies. With like black people don't stop becoming indigenous because they got displaced from Africa. Right, people are still practicing. They still have these cosmologies and practices, and people are trying to find different ways to practice it. And also, I'll say, and one thing I think that often goes, it's not talked about enough, or maybe at least in the United States Academy, is a lot of quilombos. Right, we're not exclusively black. Right. There was also indigenous people and even poor whites. Right. And so a lot of folks also incorporated indigenous practices from the Americas in, you know, various African derived religions. You know, I know some folks like to say, you know, their, their religions are 100 percent authentically African. But there's also, you know, some indigenous influences there as well. And I think that's important to think about, you know, what other uh, uh to what degree are Black people asserting an indigeneity? And then also what kind of contact have Black people had with Indigenous people in the Americas, right, informing their, uh, you know, their, their Quilombo uh, communities and identities and politics? Thank you. We've got time probably for two more questions, which I have. So we'll go through those. How does that sound, Brush? Perfect. Okay, the, the next one is uh, is actually from uh, Madam President Caldwell. Uh, you are in Brazil, you are in Salvador now, right? What's the mood down there now with movement on the murder case of Mario Franco? Woo! Yes. Woo! Woo! Ah, <sighs> uh, as you can tell, it's, a, it's relief in a way. I know people are, hopeful that there's being progress on this case that I think a lot of people thought was never going to get solved. Uh, I know some folks are actually in disbelief. They're like, I never thought I would see the day that who, you know, who, who ordered the assassination would ever be apprehended. At the same time, people are like, look, this is only one stage, right? Sure, people have been arrested. There's not been a trial. There has not been justice. You know, we can even say Marielli is never coming back. And same with Anderson. Right. Um, and I think also a lot of folks are conflicted in a way, conflicted in the sense of, yeah, I want these people to be apprehended. But do I believe in the carceral system? You know, uh, the prison industrial. I mean, I think Brazil has the third or fourth highest incarcerated population and it's been increasing for a number of years. And actually, I saw a graphic today at the barbershop that the number one reason people are incarcer incarcerated is for drug trafficking. And you can imagine who's being arrested for that, right? Um, but, you know, the, the uh, Marielli's family put out a statement today, you know, said, you know, we're happy this has happened, but this is still, you know, one, one, you know, there's still many steps to go to actually find out what happened. And the other question is, you know, we can find out what happened with, you know, Marielli and, you know, all the, the corruption that went back behind that. But is that actually going to change anything? Right. Is there going to be accountability? Is there going to be change in the corruption? You know, and it's not just real. This is a rampant problem throughout Brazil. You know what? You know, there's there's many step, steps that are still ahead of folks. And so, you know, it's kind of to be determined. But I know folks are relieved and still a little apprehensive. Understand, understandably so. Understandably so. The final question uh, I want to. 
uh, read is from Jen M. Jackson. And they ask, in your intimacy chapter, you talk about the ways that men replicate homophobia, transphobia, misogyny, etc. And in this chapter, you also reiterate the definition of a quilombo, right? Unity, community, etc. Right? How are these larger and broader systemic concerns obstacles to that unity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... I mean, one thing I've seen in the past, I guess I would say five years. Uh, well, actually, let me start to the beginning of the project. You know, hip hop is still very much a hyper masculine black space. And, you know, in some ways, by is no different. Uh, so I've seen, you know, at, at freestyle competitions, quite a bit of transphobia, homophobia, et cetera. Um, there's been a big step now to banning that. Right, like we're we're not going to tolerate this anymore. And you're also seeing a lot more artists um, who are gender nonconforming, who are trans, etc., who are rising up in the scene. But I think, you know, there's still a lot more to be done. And you know, I kind of even allude to this to myself in the book. I'm like, you know, this book only goes so far, right? You know, there's. I think a lot more work to be done on the LGBTQ community here about the ways that we're incorporating our siblings in ways that don't reify a certain, um, you know, other forms of normativity, right? And so I think there's still, you know, I, I know folks are doing it, um, but I think there's also a whole lot more to be done. It continues. The work continues. The work continues. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bryce. I want to um, now relinquish the floor, the screen floor, as it were, to uh, to Kia, uh, Madam President. Yes, thank you so much, James and Bryce. This was such a rich discussion. And congratulations again, Bryce. I hope you feel good about having your book baby out in the world <laughs> yes. um and thank you for sharing your thinking behind it you know with us um and it's just really exciting it's so rich and uh, you know there were two things that stuck with me especially but what you said about it being a diasporic love letter because i did have a sense of love and care in the way that you were talking about um how you conducted the research the interactions but also just the analysis and then also in African indigeneities, right? I think that that is something that deserves further discussion, right? Amongst those of us in an, in, in an organization such as Oswad, as, as well as our um, colleagues in indigenous studies. So I just wanna thank everyone for, for coming today. I want to thank also James Perla, who has provided tech support and Rochelle Roberts, who um, provided logistical support for this event. And uh, the video will be posted on Oswad's YouTube channel um, in the next week or so. Um, and I also invite you to view our past virtual events. Um, we did one earlier this month, which was a really nice tribute to the um, Professor Michelle Mugo, who's, uh, she was, was one of Oswad's co-founders and she passed away last year. So it was a tribute to her life and legacy. Our next book talk will be on April 29th with Professor Alexis Wells Ogogome, and she's the winner of Oswald's 2022 Outstanding First Book Prize. She'll be in conversation with Professor Diane Stewart about her book, uh, The Souls, about Alexis's book, The Souls of Women Folk, and that will be on April 29th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. So um, that announcement will be on our social media channels starting tomorrow. Um, so thanks again, everyone. It was good to see you and so wonderful to celebrate um, Bryce's wonderful work. And I'm hoping that it, it will have an impact in how we um, think about Black communities and hip hop in Brazil. So have a good evening.